Welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I'm your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Anthony Ricci. If you're a first-time listener, hit the subscribe button. Just hit it. Like the show. You can find us on YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Our special guest today is Dr. Michael Roberts. Briefly, his educational background, he got his... You know what? You're one of the uh, a few others that also has a BS in biology. I think I'm the other one. <laughs> no one else has a biology degree, but you got it. 2003, Baylor University. Yep. You also got your master's degree in exercise phys at Baylor in 2006. Yep. And then you got your PhD in exercise phys at the University of Oklahoma 2010. Who was your mentor at Oklahoma? So Chad was my mentor, Chad Kirksick. Uh, we had met at Baylor with Rick Kreider. And then oh. I went over there and, and uh, did my PhD with Chad and, and you know, Jeff, obviously Jeff Stout, he was on my committee as well. So yeah, good mentor. It's funny how everyone's sort of interrelated in terms of who mentored who and whatnot. Um, yes. But yes. you've created a, a quite a nice, uh, I guess, research uh, group for yourself at Auburn. By the way, a lot of people don't realize I was at Auburn for not quite a year in the 1980s. I actually started... My PhD program there, Mike Stone was there at the time, and yep. long story short, ended up going to University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center to do some of that work on muscle fiber hyperplasia, which you are well aware of. Yes, I am. So, I know your work. <laughs> so I know your hyperplasia work and your and your high protein work. I'm a fan <laughs> of it all. Thank you, thank you. That that seems to be. Uh, it's funny, the kind of research that you do, or I do, or anyone. You don't realize what people sort of sort of hold on to, and that's what you get known for, even though it may not be on purpose. Um, and that sort of brings me to the the study you did. Um, I guess it was for Brett Contreras. He was one of the funders of it. Yep. The the hip thrust squat study. It's one of those where it's probably not something you would do on your own. It's like, well, oh, I, I can't wait to see if squats are better than hip thrusts. But it's one of those that you'll get known for because you're the first to do it. That so is correct. Tell us how that came about because here's the funny part. And I know it's probably good you stay off social media. You're not someone who's on there all the time, but but the arguments about squats and hip thrusts got to the point where it's like, I can't believe people waste their time arguing mm. about this. So Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Brett and I, we had crossed paths actually at ISSN, I think is the first time that we had crossed paths. Uh, that one was in Vegas, I believe. Yeah, uh, but we've been following each other and he'll tweet out our articles and he's been a really uh, um, good supporter of the laboratory. And so I finally reached out and just thanked him. And that led to a conversation about, you know, doing something together. And so we sort of put our heads together. He educated me about the holy wars that are being waged <laughs> on <laughs> squat v hip thrust. And I thought it was a, you know, a, a solid idea. I said this, even though it wasn't cell bio related, right? I mean, as you know, Joey and, and Anthony, I mean, we usually get muscle biopsies and we try to answer novel questions when somebody lifts weights by taking the biopsy, analyzing it in the wet laboratory, coming up with novel markers, et cetera. But this one I was compelled by because if you take a step back, you're like, wow, we're going to do a study that's really going to inform the practitioner and people that are, you know, physique competitors and, and, and the like, right? So I think for me, it was almost a nice little hiatus on a project that we spend so much energy and devotion to in terms of getting into this deep silo of molecular and saying, let's take a step back and let's do something that that can sort of reach the masses. I, to your point, I've not got on social media to see all of the um, the chatter. But Danny Plotkin, so he's in the laboratory. Um, he's a PhD student. He came from Brad Schoenfeld's lab. Very good student. Oh, yeah. You know, he coordinated the study. He had known of of Brett when he was with Brad. Um, and so yeah, he said, yeah, this is great. I mean, this it was sort of a segue from. Brad's lab to my lab, uh, one of his first projects as a first year doc student. So he signed on um, and we all just had this buy in like, OK, let's do the first really good study to address this. I don't know if you are aware there was a Brazilian group um, and I won't mention names, but there were uh, sort of debates as to whether or not some of the data from one paper that came out of that lab um, was accurate, shall mm -hmm. we say. 
And so we wanted to, to give our best and earnest effort to really uh, giving this attention. So that's what led to the study uh, being executed. Well, yeah, it's uh, anytime someone embarks on a training study, a lot of people don't realize the work involved in those kinds of studies. It is Correct. it is tremendous. And people, I, I think most, especially most people who have, who have not, who've never done research, they don't have an appreciation for, you know, the, the kinds of questions you get, well, how come you didn't increase the treatment duration or how come you didn't have them train more per week? I'm like, are you kidding? Do you have any idea the work involved in a training study? In fact, just a short, short sidebar. I, for my master's degree, I did a training study. It was like combining, it was strength training versus strength and endurance training, et cetera, et cetera. After that, I, I said to myself, I will never, ever do a training study ever again in my life. And I've been true to that. I have never done one. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're the, the time. So just to give people an idea, if they're not familiar and they're listening, we have, I, uh, you know, it's me. I have a few associate directors of the laboratory. And then we have uh, eight doc students, so eight PhD students. And then we have, you know, I would call it a uh, half dozen devoted undergraduates. And I mean, it was all hands on deck, certain phases of the study. So just the the bandwidth and the the time and the effort, you know, and that's executing uh, a nine to 10 week study, right? And then before that, obviously we have to get RV approval, we have to design the study uh, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it is a year process to do all that. Then you have to analyze data and you have to put it into a scientific paper and you have to obviously, you know, go through that process. So, I mean, it's a two year, a training study is a two year endeavor. Um, it takes a lot of patience and persistence <laughs> and we've done a lot of them. <laughs> so <laughs> if I look tired, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm a little bit off today, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because we're in the middle of a current training study and we can get into that later. Um, oh but yeah, it, you know, those are the most impactful, right. Uh, studies. I mean, we've debated and uh, Joe, you and I've had conversations, right. I think the animal work certainly um, at many times it complements. I think the human work, depending upon the research model in question, uh, fortunately, and at least my viewpoint is hypertrophy you know, there is a little bit of translation in terms of signaling uh, when you talk about muscle growth in a rodent or a chicken or a cat, Joey, um, <laughs> talking about Gonya stuff that that you uh, did or, uh, or rodent, of course, uh, with humans, you know, there's a lot of the similar mechanisms. But but uh, yeah, training studies are definitely uh, what people tend to value. You know, and. Tony, unless you have a question, I can like I have a million and one Shoot questions. Away. I'm, I'll know. listen in and then you jump in. So when you're looking at some of the the animal data, um, some of the mechanistic stuff, whether it's stretch model, um, mm -hmm. you have exercise models in rodents and in cats, uh, you have surgical ablation, et cetera, et cetera. As someone, and, and as you know, my my doctoral dissertation, I use stretch overload in yep. in quail and in, in the bird. And we got crazy ass hypertrophy. I mean, we're talking, and it's within the same animal, 300% larger muscle on the stretch side, stretch overloaded side than the than the control. Sure. Um, and then crazy hyperplasia. I mean, muscle fiber number going through the roof, like 50 to 100% increase in, in fiber number. Now, having said that, I am not a fan of animal work. <laughs> that sounds odd because... I did it for my dissertation, partly for pragmatic reasons, because you can train animals whenever you want. You don't have yeah. to wait for humans. But the more I look at animal work, and I'll be specific, as it applies to nutrition, yes. I almost dismiss yeah. it wholeheartedly because everything works in rats. Um, the muscle stuff, I think there's more, There's, I guess there's more crossover from animal to human. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, I do mostly sports nutrition. I think the animal stuff personally is a waste of time. Thoughts? Yeah, boy, hot take. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the microphone, right? So um, what I will say is this, I'm going to talk uh, very broadly in the sense of skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And then, you know, but to your point with nutrition and and uh, novel gadgets and ingredients on the sports nutrition side, 
uh, I tend to not be bullish on that stuff unless there's just multiple lines of evidence, because sometimes, you know, I deal with companies all the time, as do you gentlemen, I'm sure. Um, you can find that a lot of ingredients work in a in a rodent model or a cell culture model, uh, but the translation rate in humans is probably pretty low. And, you know, we were talking before you we went on on air here. I teach a research methods course, and there was one statistic saying that something to the tune of 30 percent of the uh, rodent research and in, in the pharmaceutical uh, areas translate to humans. So I would venture to guess it's probably the same with nutraceuticals, mm -hmm. right? All right, now let's pivot to muscle hypertrophy. Why I like the rodent research and the animal research, the quail model, et cetera, is that a lot of the mechanistic research predated the human research and it sort of drove the innovation on the human side of things, right? So um, Jeff Goldspink was really the first to do a training study. It was in mice and it was in the early 1960s, right? Um, we didn't see that sort of research in humans until about 10 years later. Um, the synergist ablation or the tenotomy model, uh, late great Fred Goldberg, you know, in the in the late 1960s. And of course, that led to some of the discoveries with mTOR, uh, with, with Karen Esser, Keith Barr, Sue Bodine, and so on and so forth. So I really feel like, you know, the animal work as it relates to overload induced hypertrophy, and that, by the way, not dismissing you, Joey, right? So you did a lot of good stuff um, with hyperplasia and the weighted quell uh, wing model and that sort of thing, as did Jim Carson, Steve Alway, and some of those names. Um, so I, I really do think that you know, if if you're if you're immersed in the hypertrophy research, we've read those papers mm -hmm. before we start thinking about some of the things that we start chasing. So that's that's why I'm a fan, and I do think it translates again because the mTOR story would be a great example where it was synergist ablation when mTOR was blocked. It you know abrogated overload induced hypertrophy. Come to find out, Blake Rasmussen does this later. You know, acutely showing that muscle protein synthesis is blunted when weightlifting ensues and they uh, administer rapamycin. Um, so I'm a fan. And and now I think people are getting a lot more creative with the overload model. So two examples there would be Kentucky, um, Charlotte Peterson, John McCarthy's lab. They're using weighted wheel running as opposed to synergist ablation all the time. So that's kind of a, a model that they've sprinkled in to be a little bit more physiological. Uh, then Troy Hornberger, he's at Wisconsin. He's done like weighted sled pulling and the magnitude of growth seems to parallel what you would see uh, in humans with resistance training. Now, the advantages are you can control the environment, right? <laughs> so right, yeah. we do training studies, you know, we're not Kevin Hall having people live here. Um, right. So they obviously they do what we tell them to do in the weight room. Then they leave. And a lot of times it's college students. A lot of times the, uh, you know, the environment outside isn't conducive to optimal muscle growth. A lot of alcohol consumption, <laughs> pizza consumption, Cheetos, <laughs> you name it. Right. So, um, yeah, I think the animal stuff uh, in a healthy dose and moderation, using it for informing uh, is good when you can complement human data with animal data. And we try to, do, you know, we. We're working on a current project looking at a novel protein that we think is important for hypertrophy. So we found this in humans with a weightlifting study. Now we're going to a rodent model, sure enough. Uh, with overload, this protein is up as well. And then we can start thinking about genetic manipulation, which you can't do in humans. So if we knock this protein right. out in rodents or in cells, does it prevent hypertrophy? But again, it's it's complementing, right? It's not leaning on the road model and saying that's the end of the story. So yeah, yeah, I think when you're talking about sort of pure muscle physiology, the translation from rodent to human makes more sense. Uh, when you're particularly when you're talking about models that try to mimic exercise, sure. Um, so I agree with you on that. It's the nutrition part that that you know it's gotten to the point where I, I wish like you know, there was such a thing as a pet rat industry because I'd have a supplement for everyone who has a pet rat. 
Uh, yep. Cause, cause yep. I just remember, uh, this was a long time ago. I, the, the initial work on, on CLA, I forget the gentleman who was, who did that research in rodents showed that these rodents got crazy. They lost a crazy amount of fat mass. Sure. And I think they even got muscle hypertrophy. And what do you know? CLA does pretty much nothing in people. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So a hundred percent agreed on that. And a lot of times the dosing regimens aren't aren't great. You know, people yeah. have come out with equations to try to adjust for body surface area and metabolism. So I think that's, you know, one good example of, of nutrition is, is uh, what Lane Norton and Don Lehman did with uh, protein. some of the protein stuff. Right. Yeah. But again, that was realistic dosing and things of that nature. So I think if you embark upon it, if you have students listening and they're, they're going to get into that, you just have to do your homework and, and really figure out dosing regimens and, and things of that nature. Okay, I want you to settle a debate. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, do humans undergo skeletal, skeletal muscle fiber hyperplasia vis-a-vis -vis weight training? Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, so I know you were a proponent of that, or last <laughs> I checked up on your on your write-ups and your online content. Um, boy, oh, boy, I wish I would have done just a tad bit more homework on that because there was a recent publication. I can't think of where I freaking saw this, uh, but the math seems to work out and I've seen it before. So again, I don't know this group. It was, I think in the mid two thousands, um, but they had looked at uh, anabolic steroid users and they had taken trapezius biopsies, right? So based on the sort of muscle mass, and then if you sort of consider, okay, well, the fibers are this large and then you scale all this to calculate fiber number, there seems to be something there, right? Uh, yeah, in terms yeah. of more fibers. Now, then the argument goes, well, was it just that weightlifters were born with more fibers, which you clearly can't answer that question. Um, all of that being said, you know, these are just point counterpoints I'm bringing up. You do seem to see obviously larger muscle mass uh, in, in weightlifters. And the fiber size is also larger, but when you say, okay, based on those two components, weightlifters do have more fibers, right? Because you can scale all this into math. Um, you see that time and time again, based on some of the animal work, if you believe that muscle is conserved across mammals and you see evidence of fiber splitting in the rodent, I don't see as to why it would not happen Um in, in humans. Now, when I say hyperplasia, that that has different, you know, sort of uh, potential there. One form of hyperplasia would be satellite cells being activated and fusing together to form a new fiber, right? Mm -hmm. And some evidence of that would be, okay, if, if you look at muscle under a microscope and we have people that are weightlifting and we take serial biopsies, you know, week after week after week after week, some of those muscle fibers that are small, they're going to express proteins, which would indicate that they're kind of novel cells. So like embryonic myosin heavy chain would be one of those markers. You see that. I mean, you, you can count a small percentage, but with weightlifting, you'll see that occur. So that's a little bit of evidence to suggest that, hey, we could have a new fiber here, right? And that could be born from satellite cells that are activated and, and fusing together. The other thought is that once a fiber gets really large, it may just split and create two daughter myofibers or muscle cells. The evidence from that or of that comes from uh, there again, this 2005, I think, paper, Erickson et al. And I need to do a better job with the senior author. But you, you see under a microscope that if we are viewing muscle and cross-section, mm -hmm. the cell membranes will start sort of invaginating and you have centrally located nuclei, which would indicate that you're, you're seeing the process of a fiber splitting in that cross-section. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, actually, well, just sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, yeah. I, uh, one of my papers on progressive stretch overload, I actually followed a mus muscle fibers, uh, you know, uh, serial, yeah, 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 and basically looked at the largest fiber. We had fibers that were, and a lot of people won't won't can't relate to these numbers, but it was I think the largest we measured was like twenty four thousand square microns, right? Oh so God. gigantic, <laughs> yeah, so, that's huge, 
right? Yeah. So I was able to follow a lot of these large fibers in serial cross sections, and they do start to sort of split out. And oh, not that they they tend to, they actually do because I'm following it. And um, it seems like once you get beyond like 20,000 you know, square microns, it won't get any larger. So th that might, to my knowledge, that's the only paper that looked at the concept of critical cell size. I haven't seen any, and you mentioned, you're talking about one in the 2000s and, the, and I'm not familiar with that paper, but. I'll try to find it. Do you guys have show notes you can link to? Uh, I don't think so. All good. I would not know how to set that up, so don't ask me. Okay. <laughs> but I'll I'll send it to you. Uh, I'll send it to both you, Tony and, and Joey, and, and that would be uh, wonderful. Whatever you want to do with that, if you want to do a write up on it or whatever. Okay. But if it's in steroid users, um, so that's the caveat there, right? And then people right, are like, right. oh, well, it's in steroid users, and I'm like, yeah, but again, um, who it's cares? Still hypertrophy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It just accelerated muscle growth at this point, right? right. Still right. The, the cell splitting, et cetera. So, yeah. And gentlemen, do you think there may be a possibility here that it also could be age contingent? So let's say the stimulus happens earlier in life, maybe 15 or 16 years yeah. of age, as opposed to 25 or 30, just like at that given age, um, neurogenesis is greater in the brain, right? Oh, so yeah. I'm wondering if there there's a potential age component that if the the a younger individual is subjected to, you know, various stimulus regarding loading and, and maybe there's a greater propensity there. I, I don't know, but it, it may be possible. Yes. So to, uh, yeah, to your point, to, well, ethically, we can't do that, right? We can't take biopsies out of kids, but no, exactly. you always hear about, oh, that, that kid grew up on a farm, right? He was, right, right. He was yeah. carrying buckets, traps up to his ears. I've heard that <laughs> argument. Um, doesn't have to lift much, just looks like a beast all the time. No, I think that's that's a that's a very very fair point. Um, and again, so I'm gonna sell the rodent model, right? So <laughs> you can manipulate the rodent model to answer that sort of question and then sort of extrapolate it out. Um, but I know John McCarthy; they were tinkering, and he's at Kentucky, part of that uh, muscle biology group. They were tinkering with maturation of the animal doing synergistic ablation. They have a really cool genetic mouse model where they can knock out satellite cells. So when you put something in their water, it basically kills satellite cells. And this is a genetic sort of modified animal to do this, right? Uh, initially, they said, hey, look, once we give this component in the water, we kill satellite cells, and then we do synergistic ablation, uh, apparently muscle doesn't need satellite cells for hypertrophy. And everybody's like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's freaking crazy. So then Chris, uh, uh, Gunderson's group, he's over in Europe. They replicated the study and they said, no, 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 no. You do need satellite cells because we didn't replicate the findings. Come to find out, it's this really nuanced thing where McCarthy had done like mature, more mature animals. So once they sort of reached uh, kind of not like peak lifetime muscle mass, but they had accrued, you know, adulthood muscle mass, if you will. Whereas Gunderson, they did a little bit younger there was a difference there. So I think that doesn't directly speak to what you're saying, Tony, but what it does is sort of indirectly imply that age certainly matters when you overload and it could be affecting the the, the muscle cell splitting and that sort of thing. Yeah. Man, that's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense um, that if you start young, you'll just, it's sort of giving yourself a head start. I mean, but, yes. you know, we can't biopsy young kids, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, I want to tackle more pragmatic issues related to training for um, hypertrophy or training for endurance. I mean, at the end of the day, it's skeletal muscle adaptation. So what are your thoughts on the, I guess, the primary drivers? Um, and I guess if you narrowed it down to volume versus intensity, but obviously there's a lot more variables than that. Yeah. The primary drivers of skeletal muscle hypertrophy in humans. Consistency. <laughs> there you go but you can that's, do you can do crappy exercise consistently and not grow well that's tongue-in-cheek i mean the, <laughs> the main thing is that like if people are novice and they're listening right just be consistent and year year after year you sort of refine your thought and your 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 uh your model and but you know i mean ultimately it comes down to consistently lifting weights that's the, that's the main thing in my mind everything else is nuanced now for optimization um, we've had this, this sort of talk. I mean, we've done like the light load versus heavy load training. 
Uh, we've done that. Stick to that. What do you think of the light versus heavy load? Yeah, no, that's good. So I, I think. <laughs> well, do, how about, do there's think? two ways they address it. There's a pragmatic question, right? Yes. Should you do both. Um, and also from a sports performance standpoint, because let's say so, not many people are quote bodybuilders. A lot of people lift weights because they're doing a sport. Yes. So, so uh, address those two points. Yeah. So pragmatically, if you were just uh, concerned about physique, um, it looks like it really doesn't matter too much, right? So what, what I'm saying there is that in our model has been 80 fail versus 30 fail training. So long as you take it to near failure, your lifts to near failure, uh, you can go pretty light relative to your one rep max, right? So I'm going to give you an example. If I bench press hundred pounds, one rep max, probably pretty accurate nowadays, by the way. But if I, if I use 30 pounds and I did sets of 50 and the 50th one is, is pretty difficult and I rack it. Well, if I do that two times per week, I should grow around the similar amount is if I did 80 pounds, which would be 80 fell training, right? And so clearly much less repetition because it loads up. I mean, that's what Stu Phillips has found. We sort of found the same thing. Um, we, I will just say we sort of, you know, there's nuance in that, but multiple laboratories seem to suggest so long as you're taking the effort to nil near volitional fatigue, you should see the same sort of hypertrophy response. That's just for physique. Now, in terms of sports performance, boy, I, I don't train athletes, but I talk to a people that do, it just seems like specificity reigns king, right? So like you typically, if you're a power lifter, it probably doesn't serve you well to do 30 fill training much. <laughs> I mean, just not pragmatic. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question well. Uh, well what but, if you're a, what if you're a distance runner and all distance runners yeah. lift now? Yeah. Uh, do you go the high, high load, low volume? Um, or do you do the low load, high repetition, high volume stuff, knowing that distance runners already do a lot of volume. Yeah, and, yeah, and I talked to, yeah, exactly, right. So I talked to, who was it, Bill Kramer about this, because we were in Finland like a month ago, and um, it, it seems like the the advantage to ground and pound athletes like distance runners is just connective tissue strength and that sort of thing, muscle balance, if you will. Um I'm not sure it matters too, too much. Now I haven't dug in, like, frankly, like when we do studies, we're, we're interested in people that want to build muscle. We're not interested in the endurance runner that comes in and lifts weights, but based on my read, I don't think there's, I haven't seen much to delineate. Hey, endurance runners should be doing high load training, meaning like 80 fail training versus 30 fail training. Does that make right. sense? Yeah. And just a quick question, if I could, Mike, and, and I know we don't know this, but um, regarding the structural changes that might occur, let's say at 30 percent and the high reps versus 80 percent and lower reps within the soccer limit itself, is, do we think it's comparable? I mean, is one more soccer plasmic volume or are there differences oh, yeah. in what may be causing that or <laughs> It, Good question. I got to hear this answer. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah. it's our best assertion. I, I, I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. So this gets into sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> and I, this is a good segue into that, right? So we did a study with Cody Hahn where we took some muscle biopsies and we had people that had prior training experience do pretty high volume training. So they were they were like 60% one rep max, but we just kept packing on the volume week after week. And when looking at the uh, the internal portions of, of the muscle fiber, there's a, a specific assay you can do to like say, okay, well, cool. This is These are myofibrils that we're visualizing, right? Well, we sort of found a way to quantify that myofibrillar density and we showed with increasing volume, we saw that density metric decrease. So we're like, man, perhaps this is an expansion of muscle cells through non-myofibrillar components. Okay. 
And we started looking into that and we're like, oh, wow, there was a guy, uh, J.D. McDougall at McMaster University, worked with Digby Cell and, and some of these sort of hypertrophy gods, if you will. He had seen the same thing in the 1980s um, with people that did some weight training. And he had termed it, um, I'm not sure if he termed it sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. As a matter of fact, he had called it cytoplasmic volume, uh, but sort of the same signature, if you will. So we were very, I think, <laughs> very ambitious when we published Cody's paper back in 2018. We said, look, we think this is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Well, people, you know, a lot of friends even uh, in the field, uh, they're like, good and happen, doesn't happen. That's garbage. Um, we've we've kind of taken a step back and say, OK, well, Perhaps, it, you know, perhaps we can't, we don't know if we can replicate it again. And, and we've taken untrained people, we put them just on normal conventional training two days per week, not uh, a ton of volume, and we haven't seen it happen again. So we wrote a review paper based on some of the historical evidence, based on the Hahn paper, a few other papers at the time. And we said, hey, look, okay, so if you're untrained and you lift weights, you probably won't see sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, right? Um if you see it, it perhaps happens when you are previously trained and you do this unaccustomed volume, which is what we did in Cody Hahn's study, um, or if you take anabolic steroids, right? So our argument there is, look, if you have somebody taking D-ball tabs, boy, they pack on a ton of weight quickly, right? Let's say they do a DEXA prior to taking D-ball and then maybe two weeks into taking D-ball. The DEXA says, boy, they've gained 12 pounds. I'm not convinced. And then the 12 pounds of lean mass, right? So so muscle mass. I'm just not convinced that that's all myofibrils. That's I think there's a lot of- lean myofibril, man. Exactly. There's a, yeah. So certainly fluid shifts. And that's probably what we're talking about is fluid shifts inside of the cell and, and that sort of thing, right? Now, why does it happen? Can't tell you. Is it is it literally um, an expansion of the cell so we can have myofibrils fill in that that void? Don't know. I still think we need to figure out if it happens. Like we need more convincing evidence beyond a couple of studies to go that route. So, got it. Um, yeah, wouldn't if if you got a disproportionate increase in in the non myofibrillar proteins that strength or force per unit mass would drop yeah right that's 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 fair um there was one paper it was isolated fibers meyer was the first author but they took these isolated fibers and they they hooked them up to a force transducer and when you do that you can stimulate them in in, in buffer basically and you can look at uh the tension generated from that from those fibers these authors took individual fibers from bodybuilders, from people walking off the street, so control subjects, from power lifters, and they had shown that the specific tension, so the force generated per cross-section of the fiber, was the lowest in the bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of cellular evidence that that could be occurring too, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but again, I mean, that's, I, I just want to reiterate that's, that's one study where it's been shown. Right. The Han study was another, the McDougal study was another. And then you point to other studies showing that it, it doesn't happen. Good example of that. We just sent muscle to Wisconsin. Uh, there's uh, our preprint is out. Uh, Troy Hornberger's lab ran this analysis, but he had a really slick way of looking at myofibrils and myofibril number per fiber uh with 10 weeks or sorry seven weeks of resistance training now these were novice trainees uh but their lab showed that uh there was an increase in the number of myofibrils as the cells got larger and actually myofibril size didn't change significantly so that tells us that we have this proliferation of myofibrils with novice training that leads to this increased cell size but we didn't see sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. That's the important sort of takeaway there, right? So I think it needs to be researched more. Um, I'm sort of fascinated. And this goes back, Joey, to what we were discussing when you talk about the cellular limit, right? I, I truly believe there is a ceiling and, and growth. I'm going to go backwards because mm -hmm. looking at it, I'm going backwards, going this way. So 
you know, with, with overload or lifting weights, your cells can grow to a certain point. And then do they split and there's a reset? Um, or let's say you have big cells and you do a lot of unaccustomed volume, you see growth with some of that just fluid shift. And then when you take volume back down, you have sort of this restoration to where you were. That's the stuff I think we need to sort out better, if that makes sense. Yeah, there, uh, um, there was a recent paper, and I forget who the first authors were or the lab, but um, basically they, they said that when satellite cells undergo a, uh, mitosis and proliferation, et cetera, et cetera, that rather than forming new fibers, um, these fibers fuse with existing fibers. Um, yeah, Abigail Mackey was on that. Was that? Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. and so the idea that there was this constant fusion into existing fibers, it sort of begged the question that, well, then wouldn't fiber number drop? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it never I mean, I, I saw it on Instagram, saw it on Twitter, and I posted this, I posed the same question. No one answered it. I said, okay, well, that means fiber numbers should start to drop, right? Yeah, so here's, I think, where we fall into a trap, and I'm going to try to articulate this well. It's late in the day. I told you guys I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to view this as a four-dimensional process, and, and by this, I'm saying the adaptive response at the cellular level to lifting weights, right? Every, every time we take biopsies, we're viewing it in two dimension, and it's still... There's right. no time component to it. So we're just ca capturing still images and we're speculating like, OK, well, this is fusing. Right. What if it's splitting? Right <laughs> uh, now, Ab Abby's uh, I'm going to couch that and saying Abby's a great, great scientist. So they probably have a little bit more evidence. Um, and and to your point, I didn't read the paper in depth yet. I just saw the pr pretty image. It was like, wow, that's that's, <laughs> that's sweet. Um, but that that, you know, one of those images could be, yeah, there is something fusing. But then if you look over yonder, there could be some splitting occurring, right? And I think we just need to appreciate that as we're finding evidence of splitting, fusion, right? Uh, uh, satellite cells fusing all together to make a, a little new uh, mild fiber. This is happening dynamically as, as we lift weights and as we adapt. Um, and so the net gain could be more, right? More muscle cells, uh, and somebody that lifts weights. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, it points to the idea that instead of fusion, you're actually getting splitting. And and you're you're right. We're taking pictures, but trying to create a movie and, and we'll <laughs> never we'll never get the movie. So it's sort yes. of like kind of guessing. But when you look at the the animal data on hyperplasia, it's it doesn't make sense that you wouldn't get any splitting because I mean I've I don't know who else, but I who else has made direct counts of splitting other than me? Yeah. I don't think anyone has. No, no. Yeah. Y'all uh, at uh, the UT Southwest. Yeah. And um, and you were working with the quail. You also did this in cats. Yeah, we did. A, yeah. The other grad student, he did a rat weightlifting model. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and rats too. Right, right. Yeah. So y'all were doing some pretty elegant work. And I guess people are like, well, we're not going <laughs> to not gonna go that deep, man. That's... <laughs> And so I have a question. I'm going to take the yeah. mic for a second. How long did it take you to count all these fibers? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, I'm guessing it would be a lot quicker now. So if I did, okay, the we counted the, let's take the anterior latissimus dorsi of a Japanese quail. There's okay. roughly a few thousand fibers there. So just those two muscles taken out of one animal, I would spend, I would divide it up over days because I'm literally, when people say, how do you count it? I'm like, like this, one, <laughs> two, and I'd had a, I had a clicker and Mike, I hope it's faster these days, but I had a damn clicker and I had a, I was looking in a di dissecting microscope and sure. I would, I would tease one fiber, one, two, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, shit, yeah. this is taking a long time. <laughs> That's crazy. So to answer your question, the technology is a little bit better. So you can take a, what, what I know what um, a lot of people do is they'll take the whole muscle out, they'll section at the mid belly, they'll, they'll get an image and then there's automated circling and counting of, of fibers. Oh, but I'm talking about direct counts where you're dissecting right. fibers. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't you're think adjusting a... connective tissue, your tweezers, tweezers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a there's well, there's a reason why it's not published much, right? 
<laughs> yeah, everyone sort of quit doing that after I told them the horror stories of it. But but yeah, the cross section's easy. You just you know make a slice. But yeah. you and I know that when you look at proximal, middle, and distal parts, even of a tiny muscle, fiber number can be different. Yes. So you can't yes. even you can't even rely on a single cross section, which also points. And you do a lot of human work. It points to the the limitations you have with with a single muscle biopsy. That is correct. And we've actually, we have a couple of papers on that. So I don't know, uh, Tony and Joe, if you've read them, but the, the short story is this. Uh, one of them, I thought we did quite well. We took, it was like 12 people. So yes, limited in size, but the story was we took a biopsy. We took an MRI image. Uh, we took ultrasound images and we had a DEXA scan of the thigh, right? And all this was in similar location. This is pre-intervention. They then lifted weights and we replicated that approach during the, the post-intervention test. And we looked at change scores, right? So fiber CSA increases by, call it 20%. You know, uh, VL thickness will go up by whatever, 10, 15%, et cetera. Well, we then tried to correlate these things. Nothing associated, right? So, and what's even crazy about it there were correlations with MRI VL size or cross-sectional area and then the ultrasound cross-sectional area. But again, I mean, the R square, you know, so so the R square was like 40 or 0.4 and, and the R value was uh, maybe a sort of moderate to strong correlation. You'd expect that to be a one, like a tight correlation. But it even goes to show you that your tissue level assessments, be it ultrasound versus MRI, are not uh, strongly associated, right? So it's it's a problem that's kind of a salient issue. We're still trying to work that out, why that is. I think it's easy to explain when you go biopsy to tissue level, and that's to your point, right? We're getting uh, basically 200 muscle fibers, and, and we're counting the size of these fibers, but the VL has hundreds of thousands of muscle fibers. So I think it's a sampling problem um, with, with the biopsy stuff. That being said, though, it's weird because directionally we'll see an increase in muscle fiber size with weight training. And we'll see an increase in VL size. Uh, but when you do the correlations, they just don't shake out that well. So, yeah. It's so fascinating. Go ahead, Tony. No, just the, the number of questions that come from all what we're discussing here. We got to rethink the whole nervous system now. I mean, if, if we're starting to, if we got, if we do have some hyperplasia, if we do have the 50 reps working as well as six reps, I mean, oh, yeah. theories of neural drive now or our motor units increasing in size and all, not that we need to talk about this, but from this incredible information, I'm fascinated by it, Mike. It's not my area of expertise. Oh, no, 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 no. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that, we just, uh, we are just laying out a whole bunch of new questions. Too. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. And that, that gets to an interesting point too, uh, Tony. So the Mortani and DeVries, the classical 1979 paper, they're like, yeah. Hey, look, the first eight weeks of training is mostly neural adaptation. And then all of a sudden this magical hypertrophy switch takes over. Yeah. And I think technically they said the crossover is at four yeah. weeks, right? Um, but then you look at like Jason DeFridas, they had done CT scans, for instance, every week of training. This is back in 2011. Okay, right, and they right, published right. that paper. They said, hey, look, hypertrophy occurs after like two or three training bouts. Right, and exactly, the techniques, exactly. by the way, are a lot better than they were in 1979. So exactly. I think to your point, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the textbooks are based on some of the classical stuff. They are, yeah. And then we get this this new technology and we don't know what to do because like, well, we're not finding what the textbooks are saying. And um, so, yeah, just takes time, I think, to sort of evolve and and sort of have this paradigm shift and, yep. Yep. and that yep. sort of thing. Well, we're uh, we're a little uh, we're running out of time. So I want to ask one last question regarding, um, I guess, mechanistically, what causes hypertrophy? And let me break it down in sure. terms of questions that are commonly asked. One, do you need to damage skeletal muscle fibers? To induce hypertrophy. That's one. Two, does it matter if if you produce, um, well, in relation to blood flow restriction, obviously it's another way to produce hypertrophy. Sure. So I guess what are the, if you could, if there's a hierarchy or a way to rank order these factors, is that possible? No. The, okay. The way I'll tell you the question I get the most, Mike, is 
do I need to be sore? Do I need to damage muscles? Yeah, so yeah right. that's fair. Okay, I, well, we can we can go with that. Um, the answer is no. You don't need to be sore. I mean, mm -hmm. practically speaking, right? When you start working out, you're you're very sore. But does it help? First workout. But does the damage help? Does the damage help? The answer I would say is probably not. And my sort of basis for answering that is they've done the concentric only training studies where in theory you should be less sore because there's not eccentric loading, that sort of thing. You still see hypertrophy. And Matt Stock, he's a good buddy. He's published that stuff. Um, yeah, no, I, you know, just loading is, is what's needed, right? Um, loading consistently and making sure that the loading uh, is taken to an effort that's certainly near volitional fatigue. Um, I don't know if I answer. That seems too simple. That was a really <laughs> short answer for such a complex question. Well, loading is important, but with blood flow restriction, you don't have to load as much. Yeah, so. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so I don't know what I think about, about blood flow restriction. A lot of those studies, as you know, they do it in conjunction with loading. Now, mm -hmm. I had seen some of the early work, and I'm not, full disclosure, not well versed in this area, um, but where they were doing blood flow restriction and like walking, for instance, oh, and there was a tremendous amount of hypertrophy, according to like MRI. I think this is done in three subjects. It was a Japanese group. And I think it may have been linked to um, one of the, you know, originators of a, a BFR. I'm not certain that isn't fluid shift, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm just going to be honest with you. Right. right. Um, so... Yeah, I think we need to do more biopsy and ultrastructural interrogation. And while I'm sort of speaking out of both sides of my mouth, you know, I'm saying, hey, look, biopsy, we have a sampling issue with fiber size versus tissue level hypertrophy, where it can inform us, certainly is looking inside of the myofibers and at least getting a glimpse as to what's going on with the ultrastructure. So the, the non myofibrillar spacing right? Uh, there's even exciting evidence now about cytoskeletal remodeling within the myofibers. What's going on between myofibers is more extracellular spacing, things of that nature. Um, we do have a study coming out. I still have to look at the data, so I can't say anything about it, but the data is collected and I'm going to edit the paper where we did some of that uh, with BFR training. This was in collaboration with Trent Hurd's lab at Kansas. Um, and so we should, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to publish that. But I, unfortunately, I haven't dug in deeply into those bar graphs quite yet. So, but we need to do more of what, you know, we, we need to do more BFR stuff, looking at the, the ultra structure to see exactly what's going on. Because when you talk about, okay, we're going to put cuffs on and not load and we see hypertrophy. I think loading is the critical component for skeletal muscle hypertrophy. So hey, I'm a big fan of being pragmatic. If it boils down to loading, it'll be loading. We don't have to worry about putting a damn cuff on and all and worrying about, you know, whether you go to failure or non-failure and whether you do 30 reps or three reps. It's like it all kind of works. You just got to be, as, as Dr. Roberts would say, you got to be consistent and you got to load. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah, that's right. And, and the effort's got to be there for sure. And that's for optimal hypertrophy, right? I mean, you can go in and, and you know, sort of sling a little bit of weight here and there and you'd still see some hypertrophy, but you have to take it. The effort's got to be there consistently for sure. Oh, one more question because it applies to Tony. He he apparently undergoes hypertrophy quite easily. In fact, too easily. And that's why he he doesn't lift a lot because he grows too easily. So Oh my God. This is like let another me, let show. Me this, right? I'm an old man <laughs> and I don't want to carry as much muscle as I have, right? Wow. So we've done another uh Joey, I think we talked about this at the hypertrophy thing at Diamondize uh pre-COVID, right? So responders versus non-responders. Right. We have papers on this, and there are other groups that have papers on this. And you know, what drives that? Is it genetics? Is it eating? Is it sleep? Is it um what's you know, cell body? Definitely not sleep. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So um, there's there's a dearth of evidence right now on that whole topic of sleep and optimal hypertrophy. You know, there's been some tracer studies there, I think, showing that reduced sleep reduces the MPS response, but scaled out to training, haven't seen a lot there. There could be something I just haven't seen it, right? So yeah, the responder, non-responder, what drives it? Um, 
I think there's genetics involved. I think the technology we've used to say, okay, genetics are involved, isn't there yet. And what I mean is we've used like these, this is a long story, but DNA microarrays. So you can sort of go across and scan uh, different polymorphisms across the entire genome. Uh, we did that study with Stu Phillips and we said, hey, look, none of these polymorphisms explain skeletal muscle hypertrophy at the whole body level or at the muscle fiber level. Um, what we think we were missing there was we need sequencing to look at the areas of the genome that were not scanned to find novel polymorphisms. So I do think genetics are still on the table. Your ability to promote ribosome biogenesis when you load, so creating more ribosomes, which then catalyze muscle protein synthesis, that seems to be a pretty good candidate as to why you may grow. Same with the satellite cell response. So. Right, right. If, if you lift and you have uh, satellite cell proliferation, you can mobilize some of those satellite cells to fuse to pre-existing fibers to give you more myonuclei per fiber. That too seems to be pretty important. But those are the two main candidates. I think eating is important. The issue we've seen in Marcus Bauman's group is when we analyze the food logs and we look at the higher and the lower responders in terms of hypertrophy outcomes with training, we're not seeing a delineation there. But again, super limited, right? Self-reported food logs. Right. Um, even though there was no difference there, what if we would have given everybody more protein and more calories, right? Could we have amplified the response, that sort of thing? And that gets into your your stuff, Joey, like 3.4 grams per kg per day, right? Oh, yeah. Like that sort of thing. So I think even went to the like 4.4. 4. 4. 4. 4.4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That high, yeah. I'll tell you this, there are a lot of a lot of the guys who are in that study vowed never to have protein powder ever again the rest of their life. <laughs> They're like, I mean, yeah, I food. saw your presentation. One of those dudes got jacked and they looked pretty pedestrian, you know, a little soft or whatever. And then you look at the post, you're like, oh, dude, I'm going to start eating four grams per kg per day myself. That dude looked impressive, man. Yeah, that by itself is a job. If you can eat four grams per kilo, it's a job. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my core temperature should be about 102 degrees, too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No joke. Oh, my God. Uh, Mike, this has been a great conversation. Tony, do you have any final words for Dr. No, this Roberts? is uh, incredible, Mike. Incredible work. And just I'm real happy because I learned a lot today. So I want to thank you for it. And I think anyone who listens will, it's fascinating what you're doing and um, really cool stuff, man. Really I appreciate cool. it. Thank you both for having me and taking the time. And I look forward to seeing y'all at the uh, annual conference yes, in Florida uh, next year. So uh, look are you ever in uh, South Florida? Am I in South Florida? Have you ever come to South Florida? I have four kids and they're young, so no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll right. go when they're like in college. You know what I'm saying? Right. right now it's North Florida. It's Disney World, you know? Oh, okay. yeah. We'll go that central, close enough. We'll come up and visit you. How's that? Yeah. There you uh, go. Yeah. That's yeah. fair. That's, that's fair. fair. Um, well, Dr. Mike Roberts, thank you so much for being on the Sports Science News. Great conversation. Enjoy the rest of your day, sir. Thank you. All right, y'all too. Take care. Have a great day.